uh, that one of the core foundations of our religion and one of the main purposes for the Sharia that we have been given is the preservation of our family. And it is upon each and every single individual, depending on the stage of life that they're in, to understand the role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them in preserving their family. Whether that is as a husband, as a wife, as a spouse, as a child, as a parent, as a grandparent, or in any other capacity. In our tradition, one of the ways that we start to preserve the family, first and foremost, is to make sure we have the prerequisite knowledge and understanding of what is my role in the situation that I'm in. And without that knowledge, what ends up happening is we do either whatever it is that we saw done growing up, which could be right, it could be wrong, what the dominant culture is in the society that we live in, which most of the time is not in accordance with Islamic principles, or whatever we observe on media, on television, on Netflix, and whatever shows we watch. And those things, they go into our consciousness and then they etch into there, this is exactly how you should behave. This is how you should run your family. This is how your home environment should be. Versus taking an approach where we understand what was the methodology of the Prophet wasallam, and what did he teach us about how it is that we approach situations in our family. And then the knowledge, it serves as a light. Without knowledge, we're in guidance. And then as we start to learn, as we start to understand, as we start to understand uh, the fiqh and the, the, the rules with regards to this situation, we will be enlightened and illuminated and then we'll know, okay, so this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do. This is what He allowed me to do. And here are the limits that I have. This is why Allah mentions in the Quran, Tilka hadood Allah. These are the limits set by Allah. But if we don't know the limits, either we'll go completely out of bounds or we'll end up in a situation where we do something wrong and we might end up harming somebody who we have responsibility over. Be that a child, be that our spouse, be that our parents, or be that anybody else in our family. And unfortunately, we live in a time, and depending on where somebody comes from, where sometimes cultural practices will be perceived as Islamic even though they're not at all in alignment with the Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ. And then people will inherit those cultural practices and they will institute them in the life that they're living, living and they will claim as though they have some moral authority to be able to do so even though the religion of Islam doesn't sanction something like that. And the religion of Islam might actually say, actually this is not the way you should be doing it. So let's shed light a little bit uh, on this and let's understand why a unified family is so important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Quran one of the main reasons why He even gives us a spouse, which is to have a life of tranquility, have a life of sakina. So that's the goal. If we aren't achieving that, we've strayed now somehow from the goal. That's not where the law comes down. The law in our religion is expanded in various verses of the Quran. Then you'll have various hadith that are mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ. And then you'll have different actions that were taken by the Prophet ﷺ that were then codified later by the ulama who then took those and put those into a systematic framework with the law which is what's known in the, what we commonly use as fiqh. And that fiqh is really important to understand in any situation in life that we enter. So when we become of age, for example, we have to learn how to pray, how to fast, how to make wudu, anything it is that's required as an individual obligation. When we get married, it becomes obligatory, wajib for us to learn the fiqh of marriage and the fiqh of divorce and the fiqh. And then when we start to have children, what are the rulings and the ahkam pertaining to, ra to raising children? When we are inter entering into any situation in life, we're starting a business, what are, the, what, is, what are the rules in accordance with Islamic law for how I approach this? If we don't do that, like we mentioned, either we'll just follow our own hawa, our own nafs, our own desire, our own approach, or we'll do something which is kind of a hodgepodge. Mix in what we saw, mix in something someone else said, what someone said on Reddit, somebody said on Instagram, someone said on LinkedIn, we'll be like, this is gonna be my approach. 
But that approach might not at all be in alignment with the way our Lord wants us to do things, and thus it will make us astray from the tranquility we are supposed to have. So it's mentioned in the books of fiqh, this is mentioned specifically, let's, we'll start in the books of Hanafi fiqh, that the preservation of the marital bond in the family and the protection of children from harm is one of the essential goals of marriage. That's one of the primary goals. And any external interference that jeopardizes this bond has to be counteracted, is impermissible, even if that external interference is from your, within your own family. This could be in-laws, it could be parents, it could be some external extended family member. It is the job now of the person in charge of the family, which in our religion, when it comes to leadership of the family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has says, Ar-rijal qawamun ala nisa The men are the caretakers of women. Allah has given men that leadership responsibility, but it is a responsibility. It is not an authority that comes without a significant amount now of weight that you have to carry. So now how does somebody go and start to exercise that responsibility, first they have to understand, okay, what is, the, what is my role here? What is my role and what are the responsibilities that God wants me to have so that when any external harm comes to my family, not just physical, this includes emotional harm, psychological harm, uh, uh, physical harm, uh, financial harm, any of these types of harms, one has to go and figure out how am I going to protect my family from uh, being impacted by these harms. Imam Nawawi also mentions that a couple's primary responsibility is to maintain unity within their household and focus on raising their children even if this causes tension or discord within the extended family. So now somebody could have a certain methodology that they want to follow in raising their children. Perhaps that diverges from the methodology that their own parents followed or that their in-laws follow. People start to share all sorts of opinions. Nothing wrong with sharing opinions, but opinions are shared with adab. You have to know who's in charge. The parents are in charge of the decisions that are made for their children in our religion. Nobody else gets to dictate. Not even grandparents get to dictate. You have to do this, you have to do this. They can say, we would like to give you mashfra, we would like to give you opinion that you should do X, Y, Z. But they cannot control the way somebody is running their life because the parent still retains guardianship in fiqh and in Islamic law over their children. So now what happens when, this, uh, when we start to ignore these things? This discord starts to come about in our family. And we're going to get into a few examples of where significant discord is being caused in, in, in the home environment due to us straying away from our tradition. So when this interference comes in, and when we don't, when we don't actually start to figure out ways to limit the interference, arguments start to happen between the spouse, between the spouses, tension starts to happen, stress starts to, starts to be created because people say, well, you're following this person and you're following this person, and you're following this person and that might go against my wishes. Who are the primary people whose wishes have to be kept intact? The, the, the two spouses, the mother and the father and the husband and the wife. And so what happens now is this can disrupt the core responsibility of that household, which is parent, parenting, parenting their own children. And when that disruption starts, it can actually eventually start a pattern where the needs of the children become ignored, the needs of uh, each other become ignored, and all of sorts of external people and trying to understand their psychodramas and their emotions and the things that they're trying to do become the primary consideration. And unfortunately, this is happening more, more so than we realize, where people are prioritizing other needs over the needs, let's say if you're a husband, over the needs of your own wife and over the needs of your own spouse. And they might be prioritizing some, ex some external interference that's coming in. And this causes major tension. Then the kids grow up without seeing their parents having a tight bond. The Prophet ﷺ exemplified this to us in his relationship with Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha. It was a very, very, very tight bond. And all of the children that they had, they, they saw the love, they saw the nurture, they saw the compassion, they saw the respect, they saw the mutual respect and dignity that was given. And thus they became the leaders of this ummah. And they became people who went on, like say the Fatima radiallahu anha, to then raise the leaders of this ummah, like Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, may Allah have uh, mercy upon them. And so these are the types of things that we have to watch out for, and again, try to understand what are the limits. So one example of this where this can go wrong, and this frequently goes wrong depending on the culture that somebody's in. You see that someone gets married into the family, and the daughter-in-law now is treated at a very, very, very different status than the Sharia actually accords her, usually a far lower status. And somehow it starts to be the place where, let's say, that, uh, uh, that, that a daughter-in-law enters into somebody's home. 
And she's expected to do all sorts of things that in the Sharia she has no legal responsibility to do. If she wants to do those things out of her own ihsan, nothing wrong with that. But if, it, if, if she doesn't want to do those things and she's forced to do those things, she's compelled to do those things, she's told or emotionally manipulated or all sorts of blame is put on her for doing those things because these are the expectations, this is what somebody wants them to do, this is what, oh, you frequently a phrase that's used, this is what I saw growing up, so this is what you're supposed to do. That now leads to major problems. And this is mentioned in the, they, they knew this, a thousand years ago, twelve hundred years ago, it's mentioned in the books of Fiqh that, that, that uh, Imam al-Qasani, he mentions that the wife's duties are specific to her husband and her own household. She is not obligated, she is allowed to do it if she'd like to, but she's not obligated to serve all of his family and to, to, to exhaust her unless she consents willingly. Imam, Imam uh, Anoui continues from the perspective of Shafi Fiqh that he says again, the primary responsibility is to maintain her own household in cooperation with her husband. Nobody, including her husband's family, has the right to burden her beyond this. So this is now the, the, the hudud. We mentioned the hudud. Allah has set a limit. Now what happens when someone starts to go outside of the hudud? Just the other day, somebody was mentioning an example where that, that an in-law lives with them and the, 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 the daughter-in-law is treated not only poorly and all sorts of berated, uh, berated regularly, all sorts of uh, improper names are used against her, but literally the mother-in-law will like finish the plate and expect the daughter-in-law to swoop in, pick up the plate, see if she needs anything. I mean, what kind of mindset is this? These are backwards cultural tendencies and norms that we cannot accept in our tradition. If somebody willingly does something, that's from Ihsan. If somebody's forced to do something or someone is treated in, in a way where you just command them and treat them as lesser than, this is not from the, sin, the, the Sunnah of the Prophet and it is violating now the Sharia. And if somebody says that this is the way that they're going to do things, they have to get consent because consent is a core part of our tradition and a core part of our principles. And the situations, they go on and on and on. We're not going to get into every single example. But what is the responsibility now in our religion? The responsibility of the man becomes, okay, how am I going to make sure that my wife's sanity uh, is protected? And the wife is allowed in Hanafi fiqh, Shafi fiqh, Maliki fiqh, all the schools of fiqh, for a right to privacy. She's allowed to her right to her own space. If she wants her own home, she's permitted to ask for that. If she wants her own space within the home, she's permitted to ask for that. She's not, she cannot be forced in our religion to live in a home in a system that's not in acquiescence with, with, with what's within her rights. However, if she says, you know, it's totally okay with me, there's no problem here, that would be, you know, that would be something that she's willingly given. But privacy is a core fundamental right and it is part of the duty. When, when Allah says, Rijal qawamun ala nisa, it is part of the duty of the husband as the caretaker of women and the caretaker of their spouse to provide for this. And this comes under the financial responsibility. Now, to say, okay, financially somebody is responsible to basically make sure that these rights are preserved and that they have to balance now. The, 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 it's in this situation, let's say, the husband has to balance. How am I going to navigate the situation with my parents? How am I going to navigate the situation with my wife? How am I going to navigate making sure I'm giving my wife the rights that she's supposed to have and also giving my parents the right that they're supposed to have? What we're not supposed to do is just say, well, this is how it is. Go and figure it out. Be patient. One of the worst phrases you can use is the wrong application of be patient. And this is used all the time in our tradition. Oh no, be patient. Just be quiet. It's all good. What, which, which religion are you following? Where to, in which religion does it say that you just take everything that's thrown at you and you just be patient because you and me find it more comforting to tell someone to be patient rather than let's actually examine does our religion allow for this? And then we're going to be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Hold on, I gave you a responsibility on Yawm al-Qiyamah Why didn't you fulfill that responsibility? Every other responsibility you had in your life at work, with your children, and other situations were fulfilled but this one was just ignored and usually it's ignored because again the knowledge is not sought and so this becomes very, very important. Imam al-Qasani also goes on to expand. He says a husband's primary duty in marriage is to his wife. And his obedience to his parents cannot lead to a violation of his wife's rights. And Imam al-Nawi continues. He mentions that the husband must uphold and provide uh, for his wife's privacy and his wife's dignity, even if this creates tension within his parents. So what happens now? The responsibility is thrown on to say, okay, for the men, you have to figure out how to do something, which unfortunately, a lot of us who come from certain cultures struggle to do, which is drawing boundaries. 
drawing boundaries in a respectful way with adab, with manners, and with etiquette. Or to the women, if their parents are the ones who are interfering and creating discord in the household, or the, someone's cousins or siblings or friends, this could apply to any situation. We're just narrowing in on one for the sake of time to give us a little bit of context on how much this problem has just gone, gone into the wrong direction and strayed from the sharia of the Prophet And so, how exactly does one draw boundaries? Well, first one has to understand that, that even when you're drawing a boundary with somebody, they can very easily emotionally manipulate you and that's not something that you can take into consideration when you're drawing your boundaries. So now, this is also something that frequently happens. We go and we say to somebody, you know, I really would appreciate if you didn't do it like this, right? One of the ways that, the, that, that it's mentioned to respectfully communicate is you use I statements. I would really appreciate if you could give us our space. This is a decision that we just really need to make for our family. And someone else out of, they don't realize this is what they're doing, but they start to do it. They start emo getting, getting emotionally manipulated. Tears start coming out. Don't you want to hear what I have to say? Don't you want to respect me? You don't respect me. All sorts of blame and tears. You don't have to, to, to accept any of it. You can say, thank you for your, you know, your comment. Even if it's your own parents or someone else, thank you for saying that. And I'm still going to make this decision. I'm just communicating it to you. This is not a situation in which I'm actually getting an opinion or a mashvara. I'm communicating it. This is called respectful, healthy boundaries versus this kind of mindset where somebody says, you know what? I'm, it's either all or nothing. Either everybody is included in all of my decisions or nobody is included in anything either I'm really 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 nice and essentially like I get walked over or I'm just super firm and angry and push everybody away no there's a middle path we are an ummah and wasata we are a middle nation we take the middle path which is communication with three principles respect adab and having etiquette and trying to do so in a positive way and getting firm only when you really need to but don't go to the extent where we say i'm not even going to allow for this communication to happen because i'm too scared that's not that's not that's not the responsibility allah has given when it comes to the mother and the father allah has given them a certain status and a certain responsibility to say okay to protect your children you have to make sure to stand up for your household. That's your main responsibility. If you don't do so, and your children end up getting harmed because of all of these interferences and tensions and, and stress that they end up seeing, it's going to be on us and we're going to be asked about it because one of their rights is that we provide for them a, a, a tranquil household to the best of our ability to be raised in. So how does one then go about doing this? First, one understands, okay, this is the right that my spouse has for, 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 a, for a wife. There are certain rights, as we mentioned, a right to privacy, a right to dignity, a right for their own space. And then number two, one, once they're illuminated with the knowledge, has to be able to have the conversation with the spouse. Okay, you know what? Like, we've actually been doing things very differently than what Islam tells us to do. I actually want to reopen up that conversation and find a way to make sure that we can allow for tranquility to uh, uh, to be pl present in our home moving forward. So that's now where the communication takes place. Then the third thing that happens is someone starts that conversation on how do I actually draw the boundary. And when the boundary is drawn, there's a few steps one takes. First, one has to understand the problem and why the problem is taking place. Don't just put blame. If, if, if let's say it's uh, someone else's family is interfering into, into your core family life. Don't just say it's all their fault. Hold on a second. Did you ever tell them that you don't appreciate when they interfere? Was that ever communicated? Or do we just get bothered internally and we never say anything? No, Allah says in the Quran, Ya ladina amanu, ittaqullah wa qulu qawlan sadida. Have mindfulness of Allah, be conscious of Allah, and then speak in a straightforward manner. He never said just ignore everything, just take all of it. No, speak communicate, make sure that the words get out and they're done in a straightforward manner. So you draw the boundary to respect your, your approach and the approach that you're trying to take for your family and at the same time while respecting what it is that they're trying to do. Then one would sit down with that individual and say, okay, some of the things that, that, that you've been saying or that you've been doing are really creating problems for me. The way that you speak to me, the way that you speak to my spouse, the way that you speak to my children, whatever it might be, the way, the type of environment that, that's been created. And then one says, here's the action that I'm going to take now. Again, with respect and with adab and with, with, with mercy, depending on who they're talking to. If you're talking to your parents, highest level of respect is still done, but it, it's not haram to tell our parents, you know what, I, I, I can't do it like that. I'm going to do it a little bit of a different. There's nothing haram about that in the Sharia. Obedience to one's parents in the Sharia does not come at the violation of someone else's rights in Islam. This is a very important 
principle to understand. We are required to obey our parents when it comes to within the bounds of the religion. But disobeying the Creator who's given the rights to somebody else and trying to obey the creation while ignoring their rights is completely haram and contradictory to the principles of Islam. And it will earn the wrath of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life, God forbid, in the next life, and we'll be in a situation where other people can take our good deeds from us because we didn't give them the rights. This is such an important point to keep in mind that the rights that other people have, and in this case, referring to the rights of our spouse or the rights of our children or anybody else. And then one communicates it, and there will be some level. If somebody has seen this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there's gonna be some backlash. Don't expect it to just go smoothly. That's okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with some backlash if you communicate it respectfully. But if somebody communicates angrily, with arrogance, with pretentiousness, uh, then, then we would have to examine internally, maybe it is something that we did wrong, to invite that backlash. But now one understands, how am I going to make sure that I preserve my family, because this is one of the main reasons why this religion has been sent down, and we're supposed to do so with adab and with dignity, but while learning knowledge. And then one goes on a path, hopefully before all of this begins, to actually learn the requisite knowledge. Brothers and sisters, don't enter into a situation in your life where it's the most important decision you're about to make and you have no knowledge of that decision. Getting married is a huge deal. We spend more time planning the wedding and getting the decorations ready and the stage and the flowers than we do getting ready for the wedding. What is, oh, sorry, getting ready for the marriage. That's completely flipped. We should be spending five times more time preparing for the actual marriage, making sure we understand the ahkam, making sure we understand the rules, making sure we understand the etiquette, making sure we understand our responsibilities, our rights vis-a-vis -vis our spouse, vis-a-vis -vis our in-laws, vis -vis. it's a whole new ballgame we're entering into. And then we can spend whatever time we want on the actual wedding prep. But it's, it should not be to a point where we ignore what's important to maintain the harmony of the household and we do what's important, you know, what we want to do just to enjoy a function or, or whatever else it is. Same thing when somebody has children. We have to understand, okay, how am I going to navigate this new phase of life? We spend years and years studying physics and mathematics and calculus and trigonometry, biology, all sorts of things. Some of them we're never going to apply, some of them we will. But we can't even spend like an hour or two or like a weekend seminar learning about what are the specific rulings in relation to the phase of life that we're about to enter into. The first verse that was revealed in our religion was Iqra for a reason, because knowledge is paramount in our tradition. It is what has defined our tradition in the early part of the religion, and it is what has always been a core component of our religion, because knowledge brings light, which transforms, which gives people's understanding, which allows them to implement that knowledge in accordance with the way that Allah and His Messenger would like for us to. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim, wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim, ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqullah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Two other points that we just wanted to mention with regards to, to this. That first, it's very, very, very risky if we are in a situation where we allow for any single member of our household to be spoken to in a disrespectful manner. This is completely against the Sharia. And sometimes it's very odd. You see situations in which people, somebody, it could be an in-law, it could be somebody else, is speaking to somebody in a highly disrespectful way, perhaps berating them, perhaps calling them names, perhaps not being respectful. And then somehow it's written off because they happen to be like, quote unquote, religious. Somebody just told me the other day that they were being spoken to in such a rude way. And then, oh no, but it's okay because the person doing so is, is religious and they know what they're doing. I don't know what religion they're following, but our religion is a religion of character. It doesn't matter how many prayers you pray, how many fasts you have, how many pages of Quran you read. If you don't implement the core parts of our religion, that's a different religion. A man, the Sahaba came to the Prophet Sallallahu They told them about a woman who used to pray the Hajjad frequently, which is very difficult to do. It's a spiritually meritorious act. She would fast the voluntary facts, fast, but she was rude to her neighbor. She spoke ill words to her neighbor. Not, her, not even her parents or her daughter or her, or her father. This is her neighbor. And what did he say? He negated everything she did. He said, La khaira fiha. There's no good in her. She's in the fire. Because inappropriate behavior, bad adab, bad etiquette will literally wipe away somebody's good deeds, negate their, 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 the deeds that they've done because they can't even maintain the ability to feel and respect 
some other human being. And that's one of the core ways our religion was transformed, not only through religious practices and ibadah, that's important, but through akhlaq. So that's one thing just to keep in mind, that we should be very mindful of how we speak to somebody, regardless of our quote-unquote authority above them. And lastly, that one should understand, we should spend time as husbands and wives understanding what are our rights vis-a-vis -vis the other person. What are the actual responsibilities and the rights that it is that we have? Unfortunately, in Western society that we live in, it's unpopular to hear certain types of rights and responsibilities, which end up, which if we had just followed them, they end up creating, uh, without following them rather, it ends up creating tension in the household. One of them, for example, is in our religion, this part of the qawamun ala nisa, rijal qawamun ala nisa, is Allah has given the man a leadership position, which means that when the husband says something, unless it contradicts the sharia, or it's like completely some exaggeration, which is outside of the norm, it's wajib, obligatory, for his wife to listen and to, and to respect his husband's wishes. It doesn't mean that there can't be a discussion or some type of exchange back and forth about it. But ultimately, what he says is supposed to be respected. And so all of these ahkam that come in, when they're ignored and everybody just does what it is that they want to do, it starts to create a lot of problems. And then you see the situation that we're in right now, where every other household has so many problems, tension, stress, anxiety, all sorts of other worries, simply because we're not following the Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ. That's just one of the ones that, that are mentioned. There's eight others, nine others with, for each specific spouse, which we could go on and on about, but it's, 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 it's recommended that someone go in accordance with your school of fiqh and you learn what are my rights, what are my responsibilities, and how am I going to fulfill them. And then we make sure that in every situation in our life, we follow the Sharia. Following the law of the Prophet ﷺ is the means of preventing all sorts of problematic things from happening in our life. We, anytime situations happen in our community where a problem comes up, usually someone in that situation wasn't following the Sharia. And we should be especially mindful for ourselves and for our children. We learn what are the bounds that Allah has set and how do I make sure that I only follow or do practices that remain within those bounds. And I'm especially careful to remain within those bounds for my own children and for my own family. And if we do that, we will hopefully be able to create a household environment that exemplifies the meaning of the, of the home in our religion, which is maskan, the place of tranquility, the place of sakina, which is what we want in this life and inshallah what we want in the next life.